NATO summit. President Trump has sharp words at the beginning of a two-day meeting with allies. SCOTUS confirmation. Nominee Judge Brett Kavanaugh holds a second day of meetings with Republican senators. Once in a lifetime. We realized that this problem was going to be much more complex than we originally thought. We hear from an American who helped rescue a group of boys trapped in a flooded cave in Thailand. Mother's Helper, a close friend of EWTN's foundress, Mother Angelica, could someday become a saint. We'll share her story with you. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, July 11th, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Trump is challenging NATO allies in a series of face-to-face -face meetings in Brussels. He describes Germany as captive to Russia, and he's urging the military alliance to look into the issue. White House correspondent Mark Irons begins our team coverage of the NATO summit. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. President Trump is scolding allies for not spending enough on their own security, forcing the U.S. to contribute more. And the charge that Germany is controlled by Russia comes less than a week out from a meeting President Trump will have with Vladimir Putin. The president dishing out criticism of allied countries over breakfast in Brussels, airing his grievances to the leader of NATO who sat across the table. We're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting everybody. And yet we're paying a lot of money to protect. Now, this has been going on for decades. This has been brought up by other presidents, but other presidents never did anything about it. The president repeating a comment he made at last year's NATO summit. Allies should contribute more toward defense spending, doubling the amount from 2% to 4%. They have to step it up immediately. Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO secretary general, says President Trump's message is having an impact. We all agree that we have to do more. I agree with you. Stoltenberg says allies are contributing billions more to NATO, in part due to the U.S. president's leadership. On the campaign trail, Donald Trump called NATO obsolete. But today, NATO leaders are reminding him a strong NATO alliance is good for Europe and the U.S. It's great to be with you. President Trump appeared to be on good terms with French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Angela Merkel. We have a tremendous relationship with Germany. But that remark came shortly after the president singled out Germany. But Germany is totally controlled by Russia. He describes it as inappropriate for a NATO ally to pay Russia for a natural gas pipeline while not contributing more to allied military spending. Wait a minute, we're supposed to be protecting you from Russia, but why are you paying billions of dollars to Russia for energy. When President Trump left the White House yesterday, he predicted his meeting with Vladimir Putin would actually be easier than his summit with allies. That was not very reassuring to NATO countries who see Putin as hostile. Lauren? President Trump has met with Putin before. What issues will they focus on on Monday? The U.S. Ambassador to Russia, John Huntsman, tells News Nightly that America needs to hold Russia responsible for election meddling and what he calls hybrid warfare. The two presidents also plan to discuss sticky issues like arms control and the conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. Lauren. White House correspondent reporting, Mark Irons. Thank you. Angela Merkel is pushing back against President Trump, drawing on her own background growing up in the communist East Germany. The German chancellor says Germany makes its own decisions. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. These types of world summits are more about the optics and presenting a united front to the rest of the world. But the president's litany of complaints has close NATO allies like Chancellor Merkel on the defensive. Germany also does a lot for NATO. We are the second largest donor of troops. We put most of our military abilities into the service of NATO, and we are strongly committed in Afghanistan, where we also defend the interests of the United States of America. 
The president of Lithuania came to Germany's defense today, saying Germany protects her country from Russia. Before the NATO summit, President Trump also sent letters to Belgium, Canada and Norway, urging them to raise their defense spending. British Prime Minister Theresa May says her country is doing its part. We lead by example, uh, not only by meeting the NATO targets of spending 2% of our GDP on defence, uh, but also 20% of our defence budget on equipment and in the way in which we deploy uh, thousands of armed forces personnel on NATO operations around the world every day. The UK is one of the countries meeting the 2% GDP commitment. According to NATO, Estonia, Greece, Poland and Britain met that goal last year. This year, Latvia, Lithuania and Romania are all on track to do the same. NATO has a total of 29 members and the U.S. by far spends the most amount on defense. Other countries are making it a point to show they're making pledges for aid but no money. For example, Canada's prime minister pledging to send 250 troops and some helicopters to Iraq to help them train their own forces. Lauren. Wyatt, both Defense Secretary Mattis and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo are with President Trump. What is their role specifically in this two-day summit? Well, Lauren, James Mattis and Mike Pompeo have been attending most of the meetings with the president, including some talks uh, with the European leaders on the side as well. Observers at the summit note that, he, that the president has spent a good amount of his time consulting with Mattis, Pompeo, and a number of the other members of his delegation, uh, especially during the general meeting this morning. And he spent less time, the president spent less time chit-chatting with other leaders like leaders of the UK, France, and Germany. Lauren. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. Joining me now is Gary Schmidt, resident scholar in strategic studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Gary, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. In this article that you wrote last year for AEI, you say that there is a grain of truth to, as President Trump says, that NATO is like an eight-track tape player, obsolete. But you make the point that this misses important truths about the alliance. What are we missing? Well, the first thing is that the alliance actually does make adjustments over time. It's actually, if you go back from the founding all the way to the present time, it's remarkable how many times the U.S. has decided to change strategic decisions, strategic plans, and NATO, sometimes slowly, but usually follows our lead. And so the idea that sort of NATO doesn't sort of change with the times is just false. The other point, which is a little bit more subtle, is that the alliance is pretty unique in the way that it operates and the way it was built to operate. And what it did was it created a kind of consortium of like-minded states that work together and it changed the way states behave with each other. And so that's kind of led to an international condominium that, you know, good habits, basically. Let's talk about the money. Yep. Ever since the campaign, President Trump has said, everybody has to pay their fair share. The, the rule is 2%, 2%, 2%. As we saw in, in Wyatt's piece there, more countries are now coming on board paying 2%. Does Donald Trump get the credit for that? Well, what's remarkable about the summit is there's a lot of things that he could have claimed were successful. Uh, increasing defense spending, uh, some, some very major changes in command structure, and support for the effort in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but the headlines come away is, you know, it's all kind of a mess. Um, and so it's a very odd situation where, in fact, the president could claim a lot more uh, success than he actually does. Just yesterday, the European Council President Donald Tusk advised um, him to appreciate its allies. And is there a tension here that is going to be irrevocably harmed by this specific type of diplomacy? Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about it because the truth is, for example, yeah, Germany should spend more. It, it could spend more. On the other hand, by calling out Angela Merkel the way he did, it makes it virtually impossible for her to go back to her public and say we're going to spend more because it looks like she's kowtowing to the president. So it's a subtle 
you know, diplomacy that has to be undertaken. It's okay to sort of, you know, beat upon the allies to try to spend more, but you have to know how to do it and when to stop doing it. So when that they actually respond positively, you can sort of say, hey, I, I did my I job. I did that. I, but I'm wondering, when we heard Wyatt say that Canada is not going to increase its spend, but they're mm -hmm. going to provide the hardware, military, helicopters, et cetera, do you think that ex that is the reason Canada is doing that and that is Prime Minister Trudeau saying, oh, I'm not going to respond to President Trump? Yeah, partially. And I also think that, again, the allies understand that n none of the individual allies are sufficient for their own se security. So this is one of the points in this larger paper that I wrote, which is that for all the complaining we do about the allies, at the end of the day, they usually follow our lead. The second thing is people tend to forget that, for example, in Afghanistan, there were tens of thousands of NATO troops there, which made our job uh, a bit, uh, not, not just a bit easier, a whole lot easier. Thank you so much for joining us, for giving us your insights as the resident scholar in strategic studies at AEI. Yes, and I do hair, hairdressing too. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you do it all. Thank you Thank so you. much, yeah. Gary Schmidt. Supreme Court nominee Judge Brett Kavanaugh returned to Capitol Hill to meet privately with senators who decide his fate. It's day two in Congress for the appeals court judge. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reports. Supreme action on Capitol Hill. The longest serving Republican in the Senate, Orrin Hatch of Utah, says he expects Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation to go well. well he the usual uh, attempts to sully his reputation, not only uh, in the Senate, but outside of the Senate. So he'll be able to handle it, and I have every confidence that this man's going to be confirmed as a justice on the United States Supreme Court. Kavanaugh also met with Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who's urging Democrats in conservative states to vote for the judge. Not only it would be good politics for you if you're from a red state, it would be the right thing to do. Because some of us up here have to reject the, the fierce desire of our bases to take over the judicial process. Senators will be reviewing Kavanaugh's paper trail. Democrats say they want to see millions of pages of documents from Kavanaugh's time serving in the George Bush White House. So you've already said you're going to vote against him without even seeing those documents. The American people are on our side. They need to know so that they can make their voices heard about why this nominee would roll back the progress made on reproductive rights and health care rights, voting rights, and other key rights where the American people ultimately need and deserve a voice. But as the Senate minority, Democrats have few options to block Kavanaugh. We have our eyes on a handful of senators who could be the deciding votes. They include two Republicans who support abortion. One, Susan Collins of Maine, says it's very difficult to say Kavanaugh is not qualified, but she says she'll be looking at his judicial philosophy as well. Lauren? Jason, I understand you heard from the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, who's going to oversee the confirmation process. What did he say? Well, that's right. Senator Grassley uh, says if the judge can get 50 Republican votes, he expects four or five Democrats will then also join in and voting for Kavanaugh. Now, for our viewers, I know many are interested, many of you are interested in what his stance is on abortion. And Grassley tells us judicial nominees won't answer questions about issues like that, but you know they're going to be asked. He's going to be asked about that. Absolutely. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey, thank you. The leader of the U.S. team that helped save 12 young boys and their football coach from a flooded cave in Thailand is describing the rescue. I think the world just needs to know that what was accomplished was a, a once-in-a-lifetime rescue that I think has never been done. Uh, we were extremely fortunate that the outcome was the way it was. Today, the hospital released the first video of the football or soccer team. Uh, and they are recovering from their 18-day ordeal. They are in an isolation ward. Their parents are close by. The group entered that cave in northern Thailand just to go exploring after soccer practice, and that was June 23rd. Monsoon rains filled that tight, those tight passageways, blocking their escape. 21 people, including a politician, are killed in an overnight suicide bombing in Pakistan. The blast rocked a campaign rally, rally in the northwestern city of Peshawar. 65 people were wounded. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack, 
and vows more are coming. Nationwide elections are two weeks away. Media in North Korea are implying Kim Jong-un may have visited a potato farm instead of meeting with the U.S. Secretary of State. Mike Pompeo was in the country earlier this week to discuss denuclearization. An official state news agency, however, says North Korea's leader was visiting a ranch near the border with China. Coming up, we are going to take an inside look at Judge Brett Kavanaugh through the eyes of one of his former clerks. Plus, a member of the Trump administration talks immigration with leaders from Central America and Mexico. Former law clerks for Judge Brett Kavanaugh are lending their support for his confirmation to the Supreme Court. In a letter to the Senate Judiciary Committee, a group of 34 Republicans, Democrats and Independents write that Judge Kavanaugh would ably and conscientiously serve his country as a Supreme Court Justice. Joining me now is Jennifer Mascott, Assistant Professor of Law at the Antonin Scalia School of Law, one of his former law clerks. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me on today. Also in this letter, you have said that he has been a role model to us personally as well as professionally. He's unfailingly warm and gracious to his colleagues. He has a fundamental humility. I think we've established that you think he's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's fair to say. Okay, okay, good. Let's move on then to his confirmation process. Sure. It's going to be a very fierce battle for him People are saying he's been chosen because they believe that he will go through. However, in 2009, Judge Kavanaugh wrote that indicting a sitting president would ill serve the public interest, especially in times of financial or national security crisis. So there are those of his critics who say he needs to recuse himself mm -hmm. of anything related to the Mueller investigation. Can he maintain his independence? So I think the top thing to know about Judge Kavanaugh, and he's been on the bench now for 12 years. He's written as many as 300 opinions. And in all those opinions, his record's clear. He's an independent, fair-minded judge. USA Today has called him on paper maybe the most qualified Supreme Court nominee in generations. And so I think if he were confirmed to the Supreme Court, I expect he'd keep an open mind going case by case on issues like he's done for uh, 12 years. On the specific um, issue that you raise, it's so interesting that you bring that up because as, as people have started to talk about issues like presidential investigations or other things like that, um, you know, others have written that that's actually, his position on that is very misunderstood. Why is that? So Ben Wittes of the Lawfare blog, formerly of the Washington Post, said a couple of things. He said, first of all, a lot, some of the questions being raised actually stem from just four pages in a Law Review article that Judge Kavanaugh published in 2009, when it was actually a president of the opposing political party who was in office. That was President Obama. President 2009, Obama. Right. And, and in that article, Judge Kavanaugh is talking about a potential policy proposal that Congress can enact. He's actually not discussing his view of the state of the law. and so. It's interesting, some folks, including uh, Professor Noah Feldman at Harvard Law School, has actually warned people who are trying to slow down the confirmation that this is exactly the wrong route to go because it's so much por uh, portraying Judge Kavanaugh's view in a wrong light that they're easy concerns to refute. All right, let's move on to the American, uh, of the Affordable Care Act in 2011 when he was in his role as, as judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C., as he is now, he dissented from the majority opinion that the law's individual mandate, which compelled every American to have health insurance or face a fine, was constitutional. Judge Kavanaugh wrote that the mandate could be considered a tax and conservative. Critics said that laid the groundwork for it to be upheld. How does he overcome that hurdle in his confirmation process? So, again, in that case, I think, like in all others, Judge Kavanaugh's keeping taking an independent perspective. He was looking at the relevant text of statutes. And actually, his opinion there also has been a little bit misperceived. What his opinion actually said is um, that he did not think his court at the time had jurisdiction to even reach the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. It was his understanding of a statutory threshold statute that, um, that somebody would first have to pay the mandate and suffer injury that way before the court could hear the case. So I think, again, there you see Judge Kavanaugh going case by case, looking at the issues in a fair way. He's spoken of the role of judge as that of an umpire, and he wants to fairly look at every case and, um, and apply the laws he sees it. Before we go, 
He's a Catholic. He's at Blessed Sacrament here in Washington, D.C. He coaches CYO basketball for his daughters in the workplace. How did you see him um, work with his faith? Mm -hmm. Well, he's such an approachable, kind person. And one of the things I really appreciated that he said in his speech when the president nominated him is he talked about service and he talked about his uh, Catholic upbringing and motto of his school as men for others. And you can really see that approach in the coaching of his daughter's basketball teams. But what about at work? And also at work and his mentorship of all of his clerks. So I clerked for and him, was for you. example, 12 years ago. And over the years, he's continued to maintain a professional contact. One of the first people that I consult if I have a big professional decision and like with me and all others, he gets back to us right away and gives his best take and is just a very kind, supportive, encouraging mentor. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer Mascott, who has worked for the man, Judge Kavanaugh, the man of the hour. Thank you very much Thank for joining us. Thank you so much us. for having me on. I appreciate it. Federal officials missed yesterday's court-ordered deadline to reunite children separated from their parents at the border. The government says 55 of 75 small children have been returned or are scheduled to be returned. A lawyer for the ACLU fighting to reunite families says progress has been made, but the Trump administration now faces a July 26 deadline to reunite 2,000 older children with their parents. The Secretary of Homeland Security is working with Mexico and Central America to reunify immigrant families. Yesterday, Kirsten Nielsen met with leaders from Guatemala, Mexico, Honduras, and El Salvador in Guatemala City. She says her agency is creating a department to help their governments receive information on families separated at the U.S. border. Nielsen says nobody, quote, nobody is in favor of any system that ends up with family separations. Up next, a blow to Planned Parenthood in the state of Indiana and why one of EWTN foundress Mother Angelica's closest friends might one day become a saint. Planned Parenthood has closed a facility in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the state's second largest city. The abortion provider blames pro-life groups, saying employees were intimidated and harassed. Those groups say they don't practice or condone intimidation. They cite a dwindling customer base and a growing unpopularity for the closure. The Vatican is drafting guidelines to help Catholic dioceses find appropriate ways to use churches up for sale. It's teaming with the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Italian Bishops Conference to host an international meeting in November. The Vatican wants to ensure the buildings maintain some of the spiritual, cultural, and social value they had as sacred places. A key figure in the life of our foundress, Mother Angelica, could someday be a saint. According to Mother's biographer, Raymond Arroyo, Rhoda Wise shaped her approach to spirituality. Wise died in 1948. In 2016, the Diocese of Youngstown, Ohio, formally opened her cause of beatification and canonization, putting her on the path to sainthood. Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley joins us from Rome. Juliet, first tell us who she was. Rhoda Wise was raised in West Virginia and was one of eight children in a staunchly Protestant family. She first encountered Catholicism at the age of 16, Lauren, when she underwent surgery and a nun gave her a Medal of St. Benedict. Now, Rhoda suffered a lot in her life, including losing a husband and an adopted daughter. And she became Catholic in 1939, just less than 10 years before she died. And she said she was visited several times by both Jesus and St. Therese of Lisieux. Now she's credited with many healings of people who visited her during those years. In including Mother Angelica, which we'll talk about in just a minute. This past weekend, Wise's cause for sainthood hit a major milestone. What happened? Indeed, Lauren, uh, the investigation into Rhoda Wise's life uh, on the diocesan level wrapped up last Friday and on Saturday, the 70th anniversary of her death, a special mass was held in Canton, Ohio. At the mass, two boxes of evidence, Lauren, and information about why she should be a saint were officially sealed and the boxes will go to the Vatican ambassador, Archbishop Christoph 
Pierre, who is in Washington, D.C., and he will then send it all the way to the Vatican, and it's then up to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints to officially begin the Vatican's investigation into Rhoda Wise's life. It's a process that could take years. What comes next? The process will focus on the life of Rhoda Wise to determine whether she lived a life of heroic virtue. Now that would mean that she did live all of the virtues to an extraordinary degree. Now one thing that will be examined, Lauren, very closely is Rhoda's stigmata. Now that's the term that we use to describe when somebody experiences the wounds of Christ's passion. Now typically they appear on one's hands and wrists and she suffered the visible stigmata every first Friday for three hours for more than two years. Now, if the Pope confirms that she lived a life of heroic virtue, Rhoda could be declared venerable. After that, miracles are required to be declared so that she could be declared blessed. And then finally, one day she could be called a saint. Julia, tell us about the relationship between Wise and Mother Angelica. Lauren, both Rhoda and Mother Angelica, who was then Rita Rizzo, they lived in working class neighborhoods in Canton, Ohio. And in 1943, 19-year-old Rita had been suffering from stomach problems, stomach pain. And she visited Wise, who told her to pray to St. Therese of the Little Flower and to offer up her suffering and to spread devotion to St. Therese if she was cured. Now, Rita was cured, and she saw the healing as pivotal in her life and both women continue to have an impact on local Catholic communities, Lauren, far beyond where they were brought up. Juliet Lindley, EWTN News Nightly Vatican Correspondent. Thank you, Juliet. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless.